I'm going to talk today about uh, three things. So the first is diet, um, and a disclosure, I am not a dietitian, I'm not a nutritionalist. The second is vitamin D, and then finally exercise. And again, I am not a physiotherapist, um, so I am by no means an expert in any of these three things. So the first thing to say is that we know about half to three quarters of our patients uh, either use a specific diet or take vitamin supplements. And there are lots of different diets to choose from. Some of them are quite similar to each other and some of them are very different. Um, some of them are quite restrictive. And we know that some patients maybe don't adhere to a specific diet but pick and choose different parts of different diets. So I've got a couple of examples, and this is not an extensive list by any means. Um, so the first one you may have heard of is overcoming MS diet, and that tends to be a vegetarian diet, uh, cutting out certain food groups. There's also the best bet diet, which again, I'm sure some of you will have heard of. It also uh, involves cutting out different food groups, taking certain supplements. And then another example is the swank diet, uh, and again, cutting out certain food groups, taking certain supplements. And it's very difficult to suggest a diet that's perfect for every patient. Uh, every patient is very different, every person is very different, and there's not one diet that I can recommend to you that will help or fix or solve any problems. And I think uh, you may wonder why, why have we not put our research together, why have we not uh, made a bit more effort and got a good diet and taken the best bits of each of these to get a good diet that works. And one of the reasons for that is that it's very difficult to do good research uh, in diets. And there are lots of reasons for that. First, that is that if any of you have ever uh, tried one of these diets or tried any diet, I think compliance is difficult. So you can't have any of these sneaky chocolates or sweets or, uh, I don't know, a bacon sandwich. The other thing to say is that everybody's nutritional requirements are very different. So your wee old granny's walking down the street and that's her exercise of the day. Her nutritional requirements are very different to a six foot six rugby player. You know, that, that, that involves very different, uh, different types of food and different quantities. These dietary regimes take a long term follow up to get good outcomes from. So you've got strict adherence over a long period of time. And there are lots of confounding factors. So we know that patients who maybe tend to follow a healthier diet also tend to smoke less, drink less, maybe do more exercise. So it's very difficult to start to unt untangle these confounding factors and work out what, what's the one element that's making a difference to that one specific person. So there's an awful lot of research out there about diets and most of it will summarise, hopefully, by saying that the data is insufficient to conclude. So although that's not very helpful for each of you, uh, we do know that bad diets and a, a lack of, of uh, important things in your diet can make things worse. So, for example, if you eat a diet, if you cut out all of the iron uh, and you've got a poor diet with no iron, you will feel tired. That will make most of your symptoms worse. You will exercise less. That will make you feel weaker. We know that if you uh, cut out iron, your blood level drops, your muscles may, may feel weaker uh, and you will feel fatigued. If you don't eat any... Um, uh, if you, don't, if you don't hydrate well, you may feel more fatigued, and if you don't have any uh, fiber in your diet, you may feel more constipated. So a poor diet can worsen symptoms. We know that. So when you're considering which diet might be suitable for you, there's lots of things to take into account. The first of which is cost. So monetary cost is important. And uh, if you are trying to follow a diet that requires you to go out and pay a lot of money for very expensive supplements, that might not be maintainable or achievable in the long term. There's also the effect on lifestyle, and uh, I certainly love going out for dinner and having people around to my house for dinner. And if I was cooking a very specific diet, I'm not sure people would want to come around to my house for dinner, and that would have a negative impact on my social life. There's the convenience as well, um, and if you're working shifts or if you're getting home from work at 10 o'clock at night, you probably don't want to start chopping up 300 different vegetables or unpicking pomegranate seeds or do, doing something extreme before you can sit down and eat. And then there's maintaining nutritional balance. And by cutting out huge food groups, we risk losing important nutrients that are difficult to replace in, in the proper normal quantities that we need. So from all of the research I've looked at, I've come back to this, which is a very simple concept. And this is the NHS Eat Well plate 
It's a plate, as you can see, which is colour coordinated with each food group represented. And that shows you roughly how much you should be eating of each food group. So for example, in the smaller groups are the sugars, and in bigger groups are the green leafy vegetables. So it's quite a simple diet, it's, co it's common sense. And I think no matter what audience I was giving this talk to, the title of this slide would be correct. A balanced, healthy diet is good for you. And everyone, everyone knows that, it's just sort of sticking to it, I think. So the next thing I was going to talk, or I am briefly going to talk about, is vitamin D. And the, the notorious vitamin D always comes up. So I'm going to talk very briefly, a couple of slides, and I'm going to show you a video that I think was made on the island a year, two years ago. So vitamin D is needed for bone health. Uh, it's needed for your immune system, it's needed for your heart and your lungs. And if your vitamin D is low, it can affect any of those systems. We get vitamin D from uh, oily fish, from leafy green vegetables, from fortified breakfast cereals. We can take it in the form of tablets or sprays as supplements. And we can also get it from, from daylight and from sunshine in the form of UVB. Low vitamin D levels have been linked to lots of different medical problems, so problems with your bones, problems with diabetes, uh, heart and lungs, and it's also been uh, linked with, a, with an increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis. And there are some studies ongoing in the Netherlands and in Australia which suggest that low vitamin Ds, once you have a diagnosis of MS, can increase your risk of relapse. So this is a graph um, from the UK Scientific Advisory Commit Committee on Nutrition. And it's from 1990, roughly, it's got three, three graphs of the UK, and it's the average number of hours of sunshine we get each day. So if you look in the middle graph, that's in the summer, apparently we're all getting about 70, 78 hours of, of sunlight each day. If you look on the far left, that's in December, where we're getting 0 0.17 to 0 0.19 hours of sunshine a day. And on the right is the, is the average. And it averages at two to three hours of sunshine a day, which I was surprised at. I don't, I don't know if, that, if that's correct. I don't feel like it's correct in Glasgow, but I may be wrong. Okay. So this is a video. Um, it was sent to me yesterday, and it's been made by, by uh, I don't know if the team is here, or if anyone's here who was involved in it. It was made on the islands to promote vitamin D uh, and by the public health team. And it lasts for about two minutes long. We don't get as much sun or vitamin D in this part of the world as we need. So I've asked some of my friends to help explain where we can get vitamin D. Our bodies can get vitamin D from sunshine, vitamins and food. We should get a lot of vitamin D from the sun. But the Scottish sunshine doesn't give our bodies the amount it needs. We should all try to get 10 to 15 minutes of Scottish sunshine every day. This means not wearing sunscreen during this time. But taking care not to let our skin get red or burn. Remember that you can't get vitamin D from sunbeds. Taking vitamins that have vitamin D in them is a great way of getting it into our bodies. You don't have to buy the most expensive brand, there are lots to choose from. If you're not sure, ask the chemist. We only get small amounts of vitamin D from food. Foods that give us vitamin D are oily fish, eggs and meat and some cereals. In Scotland, there's not enough sunshine to provide vitamin D, so we need to give this to our children by mouth. Some foods have vitamin D, but not enough for most children. It's safer to give a daily supplement. You get the idea. Uh, I don't think it affects your voice the same way as it seems to affect theirs. 
um, and it lasts for two minutes. There's three in the series. The first one is about why we need vitamin D. The second one is how we get it. And then there, there, there's, a, there's a third one as well. So that's vitamin D. And the last thing I'm going to fly through is exercise. So lots of pros and very few cons to exercise. Uh, the pros of exercise, I'm going to start at the bottom, work my way up. So it improves strength and mobility. And this doesn't have to be running 100 metres as fast as you can over hurdles. This can just be walking an extra, getting off the bus one stop early, parking your car at the opposite end of the, the car park to your food shop. Just simple things where you're weight bearing, if possible, or strengthening, if possible, are good. We shouldn't forget that exercise is for more than multiple sclerosis, and it can reduce your risk of heart attacks, your risk of stroke, your risk of cancers. So we need to think of, it, of exercise for our bodies in the greater good. It improves mood by releasing endorphins, uh, and people who regularly exercise can get addicted and, and, and certainly recognise that. And it improves fatigue, and I'm going to come back to that in a wee moment. The cons that I've got up on the, the slides are that recovery can take longer, um, and this is well recognised, and that some, some patients find that whenever they exercise, in the heat or whenever their body temperature goes up, it makes their MS symptoms worse. And there are ways to manage this. So for example, not maybe swimming in a hot, heated swimming pool, um, taking a cool shower afterwards, drinking cold drinks during exercise can, tr can try and reduce these symptoms. But they should settle down once you cool down it anyway. So I'm going back to fatigue and exercise. Uh, there was a nice study in 2004 which recruited about 69 patients with multiple sclerosis and it put them into three groups. The first group uh, they sent to a, a weekly yoga class and they gave them uh, exercises to do at home. The second group they sent to a, a weekly cycling class and the third group were put on a, on a waiting list for exercise for physiotherapy review. And at the end of four months they found that those doing either the yoga or the cycling both improved a significant uh, improvement in their fatigue. So it didn't matter what exercise you did, as long as you were doing something that you found enjoyable, um, the levels of fatigue were reduced. So there's no right or wrong exercise to do. It depends what you're able to do, what you enjoy doing. But whatever it is, you should build up gradually and have realistic goals. <coughs> and with such beautiful countryside uh, in Scotland and such fabulous weather, I, uh, I think we should all be getting out there and doing whatever, whatever you find enjoyable, cycling, walking, um, anything at all. And there's lots of ways to get started. So you've heard about the MS Trust and the MS Society websites. They've got some great cartoon videos uh, of exercises you can do at home with a tin of baked beans, some uh, upper limb strengthening, lower limb strengthening, core strengthening exercises. And you just sign in, have a wee look, and they've got cartoons moving, moving around. There are also gym classes usually at most gyms. And if there are specific issues with regards to balance or a specific leg weakness or, or, or uh, you know, arm problem, uh, physiotherapy as we've touched on locally or we have MS specialist physios in Glasgow can be helpful as well. And that's the end for me, thank you.